Thank you, Jerome. That was outstanding. What we do when we plan our lessons, you know, music is the message. We could just have Jerome sing the rest of the night, the rest of the afternoon, and the choir sing and organists play. You don't need me up here. Music is the message. And, you know, we've been church now. When we begin to plan our lessons, we always think of some ideas that we can give the choir and the music team to supplement or to accent the lesson. And today's lesson is the power of belief. And so I just gave a list of songs that I like, and Jerome went to his spirit and chose the one that resonated the most with him. And I know you could feel it, that song. First time I heard that song, I have a one-woman show that I do on Bessie Coleman. She was the first African-American to become a licensed pilot, a female, African-American female, to become a licensed pilot. And I dress in full regalia. I wrote this overnight for a school that needed a speaker the next day here in Kansas City. And I didn't know it was going to take off, but like Bessie Coleman, it took off. And so I do it all the time, and PBS then produced it. So I was in Atlantic City, New Jersey, one of my really good friends in the Federal Aviation Administration had me there. They had three busloads of kids come to the FAA Aeronautical Center there. And Hannah Dixon said, I have a surprise for you. And at the end of the song, at the end of the play, all these kids start raving, waving their hands to this song, I Believe I Can Fly. I had never heard the song. But that became the theme song for the ending of my one-woman show because Bessie Coleman had to believe that she could fly long before anyone else could see her vision. You see, she was from Waxahachie, Texas, a little town south of Dallas where Reverend Emanuel Cleaver happens to be from, the first African-American mayor of Kansas City. And Bessie Coleman had this dream that she could someday fly, but nobody in her little community knew anything about flying. Eventually, she made her way to France, learned French, and learned to fly in a French flying school. Talk about believing in yourself and believing in a dream. So I want to talk to you about that today. There was a college philosophy class. How many of you have ever had college philosophy? It's, it's, it's mind-boggling, right? And those of you who are philosophers, psychologists, you probably think that's like nothing. But for me, it was difficult you know, to, to apply logic to everyday life. And sometimes the logic didn't make sense. Well, in this particular class, the professor was asking his class if God exists. Does God exist? And so he asked the questions, the logical questions. Has anyone in this classroom heard God? And no one said anything. Has anyone in this classroom touched God? And no one spoke. Has anyone in this classroom seen God? Dead silence. And so the professor said, and so I conclude there is no God. This young man in the classroom was so upset. It went against everything he was ever taught, everything he knew. And he said, may I speak? The professor gave him permission to speak. He says, I want to ask you, my fellow classmates, has anyone in this room ever heard the professor's brain? <laughs> Nobody said anything. Has anyone in this room ever touched the professor's brain? Not a word. Has anyone in this room ever seen the professor's brain? Dead silence. Then I conclude, based on the professor's logic, that he has no brain. <laughs> a 2007 Gallup poll. I tried to find more recent research, but this was the, early, the most recent I could find said that one-third of Americans believe the Bible is the word of God, to be taken word for word. One in five Americans believe the Bible is an ancient book of fables, fairy tales, stories, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. And others believe that the Bible is inspired by the, the inspired word of God, but not to be taken literally. So no, these people have not heard, touched, or seen God, but most of them believe in some level there is a God. How about you? What do you believe? You see, every Sunday we get up here and we tell you what we believe, or we speak from our truth. 
but not everyone in this congregation believes the same, and that's a good thing. So what do you believe? Because whatever you believe governs your life. Whatever you believe controls your truth. This week, we had another school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. Someone believed that they weren't good enough, that they weren't whole, that they weren't like other people. Someone believed that in order to be whole, they had to do something, and they did something that did harm to other people. There are people mourning their losses as we speak. What do you believe? When we're born, we are not born with these ideas that someday I'm going to do something harmful to someone else. Babies are born all the same. But our environment changes us. Whatever beliefs you came with, you can change those beliefs. If you have beliefs about yourself that are not positive, uplifting, the child of God that you are, you can change that, but it's not easy. When I am believing that I'm not whole and perfect child of God, I react in a certain way that's not nice. To myself first. To myself. Unity teaches there is one power and one presence active in my life and in the universe. Well, how can that be so when someone commits a heinous crime? How can that be so? Because that one power and one presence is active doesn't mean that I have to activate that power. I have to be a part of the power. I have to play a role in the power. I have to be in partnership with the power. The second belief even questions this further about belief. We are all inherently good because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Do you believe that? Can you believe that about someone who kills a bunch of people or one person? Can you believe that about someone who spews hatred? Yes, I believe they are inherently good. Their actions may not be good. We do things that don't match who we are. The third principle in unity is that we create our reality, our experiences, through our thoughts, our words, and our actions. The fourth principle is how do we connect with this God source? If God does exist and you believe that God exists, how do you connect that through prayer and meditation? And we practice that on Sundays. That wasn't familiar to me growing up. We didn't do a meditation. We said those words, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. But I didn't know what meditation meant until I came to unity. And I understood that the greatest place for me to be at any time is in the silence of my own being. And the, fourth, the fifth and final principle is, it's great that you know that there is a God that you come here on Sundays and you love your neighbor as yourself. It's great that you know that you are one with God, that you're connected, you're inherently good, that you pray and you meditate, you try to watch your thoughts, your words, and your actions to make sure they match with what you believe. But the most important thing is that you walk your talk. Actions speak louder than words. James Allen, one of my favorite poets, wrote, the outer conditions of a person's life will always be found in their inner beliefs. The outer conditions of a person's life will always be found in their inner beliefs. So what do you believe in your heart? The revealing word, which is a dictionary we use in Unity to translate words metaphysically beyond the literal, defines belief as an inner acceptance of an idea as true, and it's closely related to faith. Now, I may believe that all people are against me. I may believe that nobody, nothing, but, nothing good is going to happen for me. That becomes my reality, and I act that out. You'll see it. It'll show up. 
the way I behave, then you know I have a faulty belief system. Because if I truly believe that I am God's whole and perfect child, I can't also believe that I'm not good enough, I'm not enough, and all those other negative things that I might sometimes think of. I cannot believe that. That's just not true. It's not my innate ability. It's not my birthright. Some months ago, we did the Four Agreements series by Don, Dr. Don Miguel Reese. And you may remember some of those agreements, like be impeccable with your word, don't make assumptions, Ray Dodd, a student of Don Miguel Reese, has written a book called The Power of Belief. It's a really good book if you want to read it. He says, belief is the power to create. It is your deepest beliefs that hold your attention and cause you to take or avoid taking action. Many of our beliefs come from childhood. What beliefs do you have from childhood? I remember this idea that there were two spirits at, at work all the time in me. One was good and one was bad. One was God and the other was the devil. You remember Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it? <laughs> I remember hearing that over and over again as a child, but I never quite adapted that belief that there was something wrong in me that would cause me, some other being out here that would manipulate me and cause me to do things that I knew were not in alignment with my true belief. But if we don't challenge our beliefs, they can do great harm to ourselves and to others. I venture to say that of the 270 school shootings that have occurred since Columbine, someone had a false sense of who they are. Someone did not know who they are. In the metaphysical Bible class this morning, we talked about that. How do you adapt a belief system that supports what you want in life and not what other people have said to you or about you, that supports what you want? So I guess before you answer the question, what do I believe, the question is, what do you want? What do you want? Because if your beliefs and your desires line up, you can have what do you want? You can fly, just like Bessie Coleman. She believed that she could do this no matter how many people told her it was a dumb idea. If people were meant to fly, they were born with wings in the old days, they would say. But she believed in this dream. And because she aligned her want with her belief, in 1921, she accomplished it. We say here in Unity, at Unity Temple on the Plaza, that this is a place where diversity is praised and peace and harmony are the rewards. We want this to be a world inside this church and outside of inclusion. We are what we believe. When we recite Duke's peace prayer, do you believe that? Those are Duke's ideas. That was Duke's belief. But we've adapted that belief as our own. I hope that when we read this peace prayer, we really take it into our consciousness and believe. On this day, I dedicate myself to peace on earth. Maybe I can't do anything about something that happened in Santa Fe, Texas, but I can do something about me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with who? Me. So what is mine to do to bring about the belief that I want? What do I want? Do I want peace and harmony? Am I creating peace and harmony wherever I go? Do I question myself when I'm not feeling in harmony and at peace? Aristotle said the unexamined life is not worth living. Do I examine my thoughts? Scripture says create in me a clean heart. A clean heart. Am I completely clean? So maybe I don't, I don't go out and get a gun and shoot anybody. But there's scripture that says the power of life and death lies in the power of the tongue. Life and death lies in the power of the tongue. How many murders have I committed with my mouth? A world of inclusion. If we want it, we have to 
believe in inclusion. We have to walk our talk. We have to be inclusive. And we have to stop getting stuck in our stories. I have stories. I don't take the time to share them all, and you should be grateful. <laughs> you should walk out of here saying, hallelujah, she didn't pour all those stories on me. But all of us have stories, and we get stuck in them. I want to go back to when Dr. Jacob Lieberman was here a few weeks ago, the optometrist who discovered that eyesight and vision are not the same thing. He wrote a book called Take Off Your Glasses and See. He wrote another book called Luminous Life. And in Luminous Life, he recants a couple of stories of people who were stuck in their stories and how our belief systems can keep us stuck. In one case, you, I shared this with you before, he was examining a woman who had been cross-eyed since birth, and she couldn't read or drive because everything was double. She, she had double vision. And so he said he tried an experiment. He put one soft contact lens in one eye that was for distance and another soft co uh, contact lens in the other eye that was for close up. He had her close her eyes, walk around the room. Then he had to go outside the room and come back in. He said, now open your eyes and tell me what you see. And she looked down at a piece of paper and she could read and it wasn't double. She went, oh my God. This is the first time in my life I can actually see without seeing double. You mean I could drive a car? I could read? He said, yes, I, if you let me, I think I can fix this. And you know what she did? She started telling him her story all over again. And every time he said, you know, if you just let me, I know I can fix this. She'd start over telling, but you know how long I've had, you know how long, I've, I've never been able to see. I've got double vision. My mom says I'll never be able to drive. I can't, you know. and he realized that sometimes we're so comfortable with our story that our belief and our wants don't match up. I want to be free of whatever this is. I want a good relationship. I want a good job. I want to make more money, but in my belief system, I've told myself that I'm not worthy of that. I'll never have that nice home or that nice car or that nice job. I'll always be stuck. And where am I stuck? In my belief. Because when you truly believe that you can do something, trust me when I say, if it is humanly possible and you put your faith into it and it's meant for you, now, don't go off trying to believe in something that's not meant for you. If you don't want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane, don't do that. That's not meant for you. But everybody has some kind of dream that maybe you put on the back burner or you were told, oh, you're too old for that or you'll never be able to do that. But your want and your beliefs have to line up. I'm the first one in my family to graduate from college, and I'm the youngest of three. And I believed that if I drew a picture of me in my cap and gown with the gold cord and the Phi Theta Kappa shawl, that I would look like that when I graduated. And when I enrolled, I didn't have a dime. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it, but I just knew I was going to get it. I was hungry for it. And my boss said to me, Sandy, now you can put in for a tuition assistance reimbursement, but they're not going to pay for a lot of classes, you can only get three hours. Okay, so I filled it out, and the, it was 12 hours, it was the PACE program, the program for adult college education at Kansas City, Kansas Community College. So I filled out the paperwork, and my boss, Mike, said, Sandy, you need to change this, because you know I'll sign it, but they're not gonna approve this in personnel. You put 12 hours down here, they're only gonna approve three. Okay, Mike, let's see what happens. I was in unity. <laughs> so. I believed that I could do this. I believed it was going to happen. So I enrolled. I got to the place where they asked for your money. I had none. They said, show up for class, and you'll be given about two weeks, and then you'll be kicked out. You're, you won't be in the computer system. You'll be kicked out. I didn't care. God had this. I knew it. I believed it. Before I could even show up for class, I got a call from personnel that week. We need you to come up. We want to talk to you about this tuition assistance program. And I went up and Mike says to me as I was leaving, I don't want you to be disappointed, but remember what I told you. Okay, Mike. They paid for all 12 hours. Books, mileage, the whole thing. 
So the next semester, I thought, I'm going to do this again. And Mike says, Sandra, I don't want to even sign this. Just do it, Mike. So I go up to personnel, 12 hours are paid for. He said I was going to have to pay that back. Lord knows who in the government is watching this. But I never paid it back. <laughs> they never asked for it because I believed. I don't know who held that pen that day, whose fingers were on the keyboard when they approved it. But I know God was in the plan. When you believe in something with all your heart, you will receive it. If it's for you, it will be. So don't get stuck in your story, the I can'ts and the what ifs and maybe so's and maybe nots. Don't get stuck. Ray Dodd says, give up the need to be right. Now that's one I struggle with. Give up the need to be right. How many of you have that issue sometimes? <laughs> you want to be right or you want to be happy? Especially when you're arguing with a spouse. You want to be right or you want to be happy? Right? <laughs> both. Sometimes you can't have it both ways. So when lawyers come before a judge to argue a case, they have one goal in mind, and that is to prove that they're right. If you listen to what you say to yourself, you'll find out the same thing. You're like your own attorney, always trying to prove yourself to be right. Am I, am I right? Am I touching on, stepping on some toes here? I know mine are kind of hurting. If you, you can't forgive, why? Because then that destroys your belief that you're always right. Forgiveness means I have to admit that I'm not always right, and maybe if I am right, it's still okay to forgive. So the reason we can't let go of the old, those false beliefs that we're holding on to, is because we want to be right. And if it shakes our paradigm, that means maybe we had something off a little bit. Our Courageous Conversations group here at the Temple started almost two years ago for this same reason. We wanted to know how not right we are sometimes about judging ourselves and other people. And we're the ones showing the movie, same kind of different as me this afternoon at noon. Based on a true story about beliefs and how our be beliefs can be so overpowering until we examine our lives, examine ourselves and say, you know, maybe that belief that I've carried since childhood is not really who I am. That's someone else's story, someone else's belief. Sometimes our parents are afraid that something might happen to us, so they instill our beliefs, their belief system on us. Sometimes for our highest good, safety, but sometimes we adapt those and carry them into adulthood. I can't do this and I can't do that because, well, mama said or daddy said. So how do you change your belief system? One step at a time. First of all, you need to become aware of what it is that you want and what it is that you believe and do these two things come together. You need to watch what you're thinking and saying to yourself. I'm not talking about to other people. It starts here. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. It starts in my own consciousness. And whatever those old tapes and old paradigms are that keep playing over and over in your head, Put them on the shelf, erase them. They've outlived their usefulness and create a new belief system. You do that through denials and affirmations. Deny what no longer serves you and affirm the good that you want in your life. Scripture says, call things that are not as though they were. What that means is it might not be appearing the way you want it right now, but believe it. Believe it into existence. Eric Butterworth, one of our greatest writers in unity, wrote this, Discover the Power Within You, among other books, said, the formula is C plus B equals A. Conceive it and believe it and you will achieve it. Conceive it and believe it and you will achieve it. It's hard to change old paradigms and old beliefs. It really is. So I want to ask you, just before we go into meditation, what steps will you take today to release some old beliefs that no longer serve you? If your belief is my life isn't working out the way I'd hoped it would. When we go into prayer and meditation, how about you change that to my life 
is working out just as I expected. And then raise your level of expectations. What do you expect? What do you want? The question is for you to answer. Does God exist in you? Have you heard the truth? Have you touched the truth? Have you seen the truth? The truth is, it is the truth. And the truth is in you. You have the power to make your life the greatest that it can be by changing how you believe. That's the power of belief. Let's take those thoughts into the silence. <laughs>